Hello, I'm Randy Barber, and I'd like to welcome you to Let's Talk Education. As you know, this is a chance that we have to hear directly from Boulder Valley School District's team on important topics that are going on in the school district. This week at our Board of Education meeting, there was a presentation about the Equal School Day. This is a plan that brings all of our elementary schools onto the seven, on the same seven-hour instructional day. Um, and I'm excited to have a group of uh, folks here from our school district to answer some of your questions that we've gotten, including Robin Fernandez, uh, one of our area superintendents. Hey, Robin, how are you today? Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, Rob Price, our assistant superintendent of operational services. Hey, Rob. Good evening, Randy. Thank you. How you doing? Uh, and then uh, Susan Cousins, uh, one of our communication specialists. Hello, everyone. And Tamara Williams, uh, principal of the amazing uh, Emerald Elementary. Hello, dragon trainers and dragons. <laughs> that never gets old, by the way, when I hear you say that. I love that. Um, dragons, of course, are their mascot, and so the trainers are the teachers and the staff there. So I want to make sure we, we for those that aren't in the know, know what that's all about. Uh, then uh, finally, we have uh, Renee Williams uh, from our community schools department. Hi. Hey, Renee, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. I'm going to work to try to uh, share my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, you can see it now. Perfect. Um, I do want to remind everybody that it, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we are taking them today uh, via our, uh, this form. It's at bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash Let's Talk BVSD. Uh, we'll also be looking at our social media channels throughout the show and, and pulling in questions from there, but uh, that form is the best way to do it. And I'm going to actually just kick, kick things right off by going to Robin Fernandez, who we just introduced, and have you talk a little bit about what this plan is all about. Robin? Great, I'm happy to. So thanks, Randy, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am excited about the opportunity to talk about the Equal School Day. And first, I really want to give people some historical context, because we actually have been involved in this conversation since 2014. Uh, we've been talking about the fact that every student regardless of who they are or what school they are in, every student deserves a guaranteed and viable educational experience. So what we know is that traditionally throughout the entire history that I know of of BBSD, uh, elementary schools have had individually set start and stop times. So as a result, we have elementary schools in this district that have a length of school day that ranges anywhere from six and a half all the way to seven and a half hours. And so what that means is that truly a child is really just lucky if they land in a school that has a longer school day. What we know is that the differential in the length of school day adds up to almost 13 days more instruction that some students uh, receive in one school versus if they are just in another school. And so we really started talking about that because what we know is that the length of a school day and the amount of instruction that a student gets really determines their success moving forward. And this is true for students who perhaps maybe struggle, who uh, who don't demonstrate great uh, knowledge of grade level standards, but this is true of every student. Students need who need extension, uh, instruction that goes beyond grade level standards. Students who need extra support, students who need a different type of support. But the truth is as a teacher or as a leader, what happens during the school day is all a question of making decisions around competing priorities. So we know for sure that core academics are a priority in every classroom and every school. But in this community, we also value specials, meaning art, music, and PE. We value time to support social emotional learning. We value time for kids to be able to be outdoors, have recess, interact with each other while running, playing, talking informally, and um, being able to get physical exercise. We also value having an appropriate and adequate amount of time for lunch. And we, we, we have only a certain number of hours in a day. And so when we value all of these different aspects of what it is to be a child, 
and what it is to go to school to learn about all of these aspects of themselves, to receive support and instruction, and have meaningful relationships with both their, their classmates and the adults in the school, we know that there's just not enough time. And so based on that, but all the way back in 2014, we had a task force of teachers and leaders and parents and community members who really came together to talk about that, to, to say that, you know, when there is a differential of 13 days per year, and then you take that times six years, kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, that is the better part of a school year differential that some students receive by sheer luck of where they happen to go to school and, uh, and other students don't. And so we really talked about how to do our best by students and standardize the length of the school day so that we can have fewer conversations at the school level about what of our priorities not to include or what of our priorities do we include less than others. By standardizing and in many schools lengthening the school day, we don't have to make so many decisions about what not to include. We can make many more decisions about how to include all of our priorities. So that really is the, the context of the roots of that conversation. And then in 2016, that task force came forth and made recommendations. And uh, they made recommendations about the ideal length of, of instructional components that occur also during the school day. But one of the foundational pieces of those recommendations was a standardized start and stop day. I mean, start and end time. Um, for the school day. And so, as we know, we have been able to make some, some progress on that. Um, we were able to uh, make the start and, and end time standardized at high school in 2019. So now high schools begin at 8.30 in the morning and they end at 3.45 in the afternoon. And we know that that is based on information that we've been talking about for several years about the needs of adolescents uh, to, to get up later and, and to arrive at school later. And so we have continued that conversation until we've gotten to the point where we are now, that we know that by standardizing the school day, we are able to give kids a guaranteed and viable, equitable, instructional, educational experience throughout our system. And we're excited about that. Uh, so Randy, if you don't mind, um, advancing to the next slide. So in our never ending quest to do what is best for, for students, um, we have been talking about what I was just mentioning, the seven hour day for students in, in K-8 and then in students in grades nine through 12, they have a slightly longer school day. And that of course addresses what I was just talking about, the equal instructional time for students. The other thing that the, this structure will allow for, and Rod Price will talk about that more in a minute, is that it also gives us what exists currently in many schools in our district, but not in every school, is 60 minutes of professional learning time on a weekly basis um, on Wednesday mornings. And the truth is, we're really proud of our educators in BBSC. I think all of us believe, uh, because it's true, that our educators are skilled and dedicated. And the truth is that level of expertise needs to be supported and maintained. It does not happen magically. Um, when we take a, a teacher's base knowledge and skill set that they come to us with, if they are a, a brand new teacher or a teacher who has, has taught in another context and then come to us, they come with a certain level of knowledge and skill. But the truth is what we learn on an ongoing basis about how children learn, about neuroscience, about what that means in terms of best practices for teaching and learning, that information is constantly changing. And so what we know about that is that we need to provide the time for teachers for their own professional learning. We can't expect them without providing the time and without supporting and maintaining that constant learning cycle for the adults uh, we can't guarantee that they would have the knowledge of best practices, the time to understand them and to understand how to implement them, and then to bring what we value as an incredible professionalism and an incredible expertise to our students in our schools. 
So that really is, is an important piece of that, that I think bears, bears mentioning so that people understand that. And again, just to you know, bring this back around for where I started, you know, this conversation has been going on for several years about how is it that we do our best um, for all of our students by creating the skeleton or the backbone, if you will, of the school day. And then from there, we build in to make sure that every student is getting the very best educational experience that they can. So that really provides the, the historical context. And now, so what does that mean in practical terms? So I'm going to toss it over to Rob Price because he's going to talk about what that means in terms of, of every child's specific school day. Robin, thank you very much. Um, as Robin mentioned, one of our goals uh, with the Equal School Day is to standardize uh, the length of day. And as you can see, at the middle K-8 and high school levels, we have done that. So uh, middle schools currently are at seven hours. K-8 is at seven hours. And then our high schools, as you may remember, went to seven hours and 15 minutes in the 2019-20 school year uh, when we moved them to an 8.30 to 3.45 uh, p.m. Um, bell time. Randy, can you advance the slide? We're going to pop a couple um, items up here. But what you'll see here is the difference between a six and a half and seven hour day. Now, uh, Robin mentioned that our schools really range from six and a half hours to seven hours and 20 minutes. But just comparing a six and a half hour to a seven hour day, that's 86 hours per year or 13.2 days per year. And when you think of that over a six or seven year period uh, that a, a student is in elementary school, I think you would understand the need uh, for this change. So. Um, Looking through this, all of our schools uh, meet or exceed uh, the minimum instruction hours required by the Colorado, Colorado Department of Education. Right now, only Pioneer, Sanchez, and Netherland are at seven hours or longer, and all of our KA schools are at seven hours. Next slide. So you spent most of uh, the last few days answering emails and uh, uh, taking phone calls. And I will say what I have, what I've learned, um, uh, everybody's uh, needs are very unique. Um, you know, I heard some from some parents today, uh, how much they appreciated the 745 time because it allows them uh, to drop off their students to still get to work. I heard from many others that said, man, 745 just doesn't work for me because my kids aren't up that early. And we've taken all that and feedback that we're asking you for and we'll talk a little bit further in the next slide about how you can provide that feedback back but that's what we're looking for. We'll go back to that real quick Randy if you don't mind. As we're thinking about when we built this model, we built this model around the high school tier. So high schools again went to an 8.30 to 3.45 uh, bell time in the 2019-20 school year. And the way our transportation department works on average, we need about 45 minutes between start times and our elementary schools. That's what drives the elementary school start time. So elementary buses would drop at the elementary school and then we need 45 minutes from there to get to the high schools or the middle schools. So not just based on transportation, we've done our research. We understand uh, for educators around that 745. Um, and then the Wednesday late start would be an hour later Again, 8.45 to 2.45 at the elementary level, high school tier is 9.30, and the middle and K-8s are on a 9.40 tier on that Wednesday late start. Now, a lot of exceptions around this, and I want to walk through these real quick so parents understand. We do have exceptions at Monarch, Southern Hills, and Broomfields, and it's really the way those sites were developed. The proximity they, are, they have to their local high school, we have to allow enough time, enough separation to get cars in and out of there. Um, so they have some exceptions. Netherland Elementary School will be on a seven-hour day, but they are tiered with their uh, uh, Netherland Middle Senior High School. Uh, Golden, Gold Hill and Jamestown will be, go to a seven-hour uh, day, but they will, uh, their start time will not change. Flatirons and Foothill Elementary will be 8.15 to 3.15. The reason for that is our buses run up into the foothills. They need additional time to get to the foothills to pick up not only elementary, but middle and high and bring those students back. And then BCSIS and High Peaks, just due to their uh, uh, 
uh, campus, really the only transportation we provide to those schools is special education transportation. We have to provide some transportation uh, or some separation in their bell times to get cars into high peaks, let that um, uh, the cars uh, leave the site and then to get uh, parents back in for BCS, uh, BCSIS at eight o'clock. And then Boulder Tech, their bell time's changing a little bit. They'll get out at 320, therefore we can take those buses or those students back to their uh, uh, high schools. Um, next slide. Do you mind if I insert a quick question here from uh, one, of our, uh, one of our viewers on, on one of the questions that's come in is, is regarding the, the difference between elementary and middle school. Like, you know, if you've got students in both tiers, was it closer before and that made that an easier uh, situation? Because I remember also hearing from folks before that were having trouble making it from, you know, I guess Broomfield Heights or whatever to, to the high school or whatever. Um, is, is that something that's, that would be a new um, struggle for parents in that area? The high school and the middle school tier, the separation is about the same as what it was in 2019-20, Randy. Okay. It's, it's the elementary, and, I, and I've talked to a couple of our parents to where um, elementary is ending at 245 and middle school is ending at 340. It's a one-hour separation. So that is what has changed because, again, before it was all over the board, if you think about where our elementary schools were at before. So there wasn't a standard start time like we are trying to achieve now. So depending, so, on, depending on what school, you might have had a situation that was beneficial where you could just sort of swing by both schools in an easy, compact deal, that might change in this, in this scenario. Yep, that's correct. All right, um, here, uh, what we have shown, and if you've seen this presentation at the board meeting on Tuesday, we've reformatted this. Originally, we were showing a bus drop top, bus drop times, now we are showing the actual bell times. So if you look um, at Birch uh, Elementary, for example, it's the second school down. The current bell time is at 7.50. The proposed bell time is at 7.45, so a five minute change. So as you're looking through this, the majority of our schools are 20 minutes or less. There are four schools uh, that have a pretty significant change, and we acknowledge that. So if you look at Bear Creek, for example, Eisenhower, uh, Mesa Elementary, and I believe Columbine are all over that 20 minutes. And, and the reason I bring this up is if you, you think about it, we've been doing this, and it, we were hearing a lot of concern about the 745 bell time. Um, and you can see on this slide that we've been doing this across the district for quite some time, and I acknowledge that this is a drastic change. Uh, for a few of those schools, but uh, we have been doing this well across the district, and we have the data that shows these students at these schools are performing well. And I will also say that some of these schools, uh, one of them at Emerald Elementary School, is performing a late start, um, and we can talk about that, how that works uh, specifically at that school. But I think it is important to note um, that, again, uh, the majority of the schools uh, changes in 20 minutes or less in their bell times. You look at the middle schools, very little change. Um, Casey, Centennial, Louisville are changing by about five minutes. And then at the K-8s, again, some minor change at Aspen Creek and El Dorado as we're thinking through those. Uh, next slide. This slide here uh, really shows our implementation timeline. I wanna talk a little bit about this. So last year, we reached out directly to the principals uh, to discuss this change and to get their feedback. And again, we had a large steering committee uh, that worked through this process. I met with the principal advisory committee in November. Um, feedback across the board among our leaders, the ones that do this work, has been extremely supportive. Uh, transportation staff um, really are, are safe routes to school, then met with those principals that were impacted the most to see how we can support them through the change, what they thought their biggest concerns were. Um, earlier this month, I met with the District Parent Council to get their feedback. You know, tonight, we are really launching our campaign to our parents. We want your feedback, and we're going to be asking for that uh, really the rest of this month and the month of uh, February. And once we have that feedback, we're going to review it, look at the solutions, and then present to the board with a revised plan if we need to revise that plan. So. We are soliciting your feedback, and if we need to adjust, we're going to look at that feedback and adjust uh, accordingly. So if that's school-age school care, if that's how we deliver food service, 
Um, across the board, that's what we want to know, and, and we're getting some excellent uh, communication right now on that. So thank you for that. Uh, this slide is really, again, uh, shows our communication campaign um, that we are launching. So we're going to continue to use our existing communication channels. Information will be shared as updated as necessary through the start of the year with a renewed push over the summer to con just to confirm that we're all aware of the changes. We realize family schedules are built upon the school day. That's what I kind of talked a little bit about the unique needs of every family. We're trying to build a system as a whole. Uh, so we understand that we're not going to meet everybody's needs, but we're trying to meet the majority of the needs out there. Um, and we want to do what's best for students. I think that's the important piece as we're working through here is there is no better time than now to be doing this work. And I understand the challenges of a pandemic and the disruption that the pandemic has caused. But when we're thinking about catching our students up, we need more instructional time to catch our students up. And I think Robin uh, did a fantastic job illustrating that. Uh, at the beginning of this presentation, but I do think it's time that we just continue to highlight the need uh, for more instructional time. So um, Renee Williams with Community Schools is on the call tonight. Um, I know she is eager to support this change. Um, so again, as we're receiving that feedback uh, over the next month, that's what we're gonna be adjusting and reacting to uh, when we present to the board in late March, early April timeframe. Um, we do have a couple questions on here, Randy, if you just want to uh, scroll through those. One of the questions, um, you know, which BBSD child care programs might you need or want before school on late start Wednesdays? Uh, the next one, um, with an earlier start time, do you think your child will purchase breakfast? Again, thinking through uh, how can we help you get out of the house quicker? If we can provide you breakfast, would that help uh, with the earlier start times? So with that, Randy, I'll open it up for discussion. Perfect. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here if I can get out of this. And um, you know, I think one of the questions that we that we can start with is just the idea of, uh, and this is from uh, a parent, uh, Chandra Hardwick, who asked uh, regarding the 7:45 start. Uh, you know, she's talking talked to some teachers and to parents, and not everybody's pumped about the decision. So she asked, you know, how will constructive feedback from parents and educators be used? If there is significant concern regarding the change, will BBSD be responsive to this, or is it, quote unquote, a done deal? You know, um, and, and anyone, feel free to jump in. I think, you know, as we went through the high school bell times, I co-led that work, Randy, and this is, you know, we went out, we asked for feedback, we adjusted accordingly, and then we implemented it. And I got to say, that has been tremendously successful for our high school students. I see this working no differently. And this is the way we lined this out. We've been talking about this since 2014, recommendations in 2016. It got sidelined be because of transportation specifically. We can figure that out um, just from a cost standpoint. I think we all understand, parents included, the need for the instructional time. So now what we want is their feedback based on the model that we put out there and we will adjust just like we did uh, in 2019. So I think we have a proven track record of that, of listening, um, and, and it, the community is doing a good job of giving us their input. So that's what we're looking for. Thank you for that. And I'll just quickly turn to Susan too. I know that the communication plan had, had, had uh, various things, including this on there. Um, the Let's Talk education page is a place where we're really driving folks. Uh, if they've got uh, feedback, the surveys are on there. Is there anything else that you want people to know about that page? Well, there's a summary of the um, plan as presented to the Board of Education on Tuesday there to um, give everybody quick reference to that. Um, there's an opportunity to ask questions, but also um, with that uh, structure, you can just share comments. And we are working to respond to all of the questions that come in. Um, and there's quite a few of them, so um, we're trying to get to them as quickly as we can, but um, we do intend to respond to everyone. Um, we are uh, identifying some themes as questions come in, and we'll be um, kind of helping people find those different themes um, and the answers there as we try to share this information out. And as Rob mentioned, there's a survey in there, um, which is really aimed at trying to understand how we can um, support families through this transition, um, but 
uh, you know, there's likely things that we haven't thought of. So we are um, eager to hear your ideas or suggestions for um, how we can help everyone uh, make this shift. All right, kind of scrolling through there a little bit. I think you can kind of see what the format is there. We definitely want to have people's feedback in there. And so thank you both for kind of talking about that aspect of things. I wanted to make sure to put that up front. Um, you know, many po folks really don't realize that there was so much disparity. You know, in fact, I oftentimes would say if you bring the question to everybody and said, okay, you know, we just found out that all, you know, all of our schools have these, you know, crazy different kinds of time frames. I think the overall answer from everybody would be, what the heck are you doing? Like, of course you need to make sure students are, are getting sort of, uh, you know, equal time that they're, that, that, you know, and, and we talked about that disparity too of time. Um, you know, Robin, you know, this, this really, this time adds up over, you know, over a period of, you know, weeks, months, and, and really can make an impact for a school. That's absolutely true. So what we know is that this has always been an issue because the disparities have always existed among schools, which as we were talking about before, which is what prompted the conversation several years ago. However, it has never been more obvious now. As we are working our way through this pandemic and doing our very best to support students, whether in person or virtually or a combination of the two over time, um, there has never been a more urgent need to address children's instructional needs and now children's instructional gaps. And so we are working very hard at not only maintaining our original purpose of, wow, every student in our district deserves an equitable experience across the system for all the reasons that I said before, that we don't want to make decisions about what not to include in the school day. We want to be able to make more decisions about how to include all of our priorities. But having said that, that reality, in addition to what students and families have experienced during the pandemic, makes the need even more urgent. So that's why we are working so hard at trying to figure out exactly how to do this. We know what we have to do. And now this conversation is really around how to make it happen for kids. So you're right. It's the, it's always existed and now more than ever. And I know, Samara, you guys have had a seven hour day for some time and, and have professional development, much like uh, we've, been, we've been talking about today. Can you talk about kind of what that's looked like at your school? Sure. Um, yeah, so this is my ninth year at Emerald and we've had the Wednesday late start uh, the whole time and it's extremely, extremely valuable time uh, for us. Um, we use it for a variety of different things, especially um, an opportunity for such as English language teachers, literacy specialists, special education teachers to have time to collaborate with classroom teachers. So in a regular elementary day, especially now that we have the ABC rota rotating special schedule, which we enacted two or three years ago, um, one of the huge benefits of that was that that gave every grade level team common planning. So all the third grade teachers take their kids to specials at the same time and therefore have that period of time where they're all without their kids. They have their planning time and that was a very important. But um, the specialists might have plenty of time at a different time than that third grade teacher and they've got, um, you know, they've got kids in all the grade levels. So it really gives us a good time to collaborate with those um, providers, service providers at our school. Um, we also use it for professional development, um, for training. Just a quick example, we had a need to bring in somebody from the district to help us um, get a common understanding of how to give the BAS test, the benchmark assessment um, system test, and to make sure the data was um, accurate because data is no good if you're not giving it the same way. So we use that time. Everybody got the same training at the same time. And then a second grade teacher would know that whatever the first grade teacher's score was, what is, it was interpreted the same as how, you know, they would have given the test. So those are just a few examples. And then um, as I'll just say that we in-house at Emerald have provided child care for any family that needed it. Um, from the beginning of the late start. So if you need to, you know, if you need to drop your child off at 735 every single day, you can even do that on the Wednesdays. And we accommodated that. And some of our families really need that. 
some of our families use a Wednesday late start is that's pancake day or that's the day that they make breakfast together. And then I would just also say myself with my middle school and high schoolers, um, the Wednesday was the day that we made all the ortho appointments and all the doctor's appointments because they played sports. And so it was a really nice way to get that stuff done and not pull your kid out of school. So those are just a, a few of my initial thoughts. I know that hey, Randy, I'm going to jump in real quick just to correct something. Samara, you're not at a seven hour day, right? You have a one hour late start, but I've heard from your community, some welcome the seven hour day for absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Uh, uh, yes. I, yes. Absolutely. Um, so I, I would just say right now, um, if you want to do a 30 minute social emotional learning lesson or something like the calm down zone or the zones of regulation, we have to steal that from another subject, from reading, writing, um, math, social studies, science, or specials. We don't steal it from specials, but I mean, we, we have to take that because every bit of our day is already allocated with all of those subject areas that an elementary classroom has to cover. Um, and so this will give us a little bit of more breathing room to do that extremely valuable work. Um, the, the SEL work is, it's more important now than ever. And so, you know, we're making time, but we're taking that time from something else. And I know that that's something that we've heard from a lot of uh, different educators. Um, in addition, I will say that my daughter goes to a school that implemented a uh, one hour uh, delay on, or the late start on Wednesdays. And one of the things that they offered was uh, choir, you know, uh, and then that was, you know, part of the group that then would perform during the big show later on in the year. And so it kind of opened up some opportunities that maybe they didn't have time for in the, in the, in the, in the normal day or you'd have to do an after school activity or whatever. That's when um, we have our choir also. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> it's uh, a very convenient. Excellent. Um, you know, I do, obviously, I want to recognize that, you know, I, I probably the, the biggest theme that we had was really about it being tough on parents. Uh, you know, some of the, the comments that we got are, you know, how are working parents, uh, you know, with concert work schedules going to trans transport their elementary students with the late start on Wednesday. Another common theme that we had was from parents that were asking, you know, sort of the question for why, why couldn't we consider an eight to three day or, you know, um, I know that when we were looking at that transportation schedule, um, you know, the idea of like, you know, we really like our kids to wake up later. Could we negotiate to have them start at nine instead? Um, so I'm going to have Rob address that in a second. But before I do, I know right before the, the show started, we were talking. Um, this is this is a difficult thing for every parent, uh, Samara. But this is the kind of thing that y you also do see parents, you know, finding ways to 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 make a school start regardless of where that's at. Having you know, everybody's got a different schedule again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll just say about the nine o'clock um, at my last school where I was a principal, we had a nine o'clock start. And by the time we got out in the afternoon, it was frequently dark. Teachers drove home in the dark. Families were picking their kids up in the dark. And, um, I, you know, I, I, we had kids coming to school early because they were ready. And we <laughs> kept having to increase our supervision time in the morning because all of a sudden kids are here at 815, you know, earlier. So, um, so I've experienced both firsthand. And, I've had families that have come to Emerald um, from other schools and we've supported them in having an earlier bedtime. I, I'm pretty sure that families at my school have an earlier bedtime than some of these 8, 30, 9 o'clock. And that, that, that's just part of life um, is, is making those sorts of adjustments. And um, so um, I, I think that kids can adjust, especially little kids, and it, it seems like that's what some of the, the literature says, is that they have an adjustable schedule. Um, I'm going to go to Rob in regards to kind of that, again, negotiating for a later time part, but um, I, one of the other questions does parallel to what Tamara was just saying about, you know, time of day and light, and I know that we always used to hear this with high school students as well in terms of, especially when that uh, daylight savings ends, or is in, I think it's when it's in, I always get confused about this, but... Yeah. There's a period of time when it gets too dark, you know, uh, on the edges of our school day. Uh, and so people really worry about safety and that kind of thing. And I know we've got a really tremendous team that really is, is worried and, and thinking about uh, safe routes to school. I talk about yeah. kind of what's gone into that and then again, the whole schedule piece of it. Yeah, and I, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the schedule piece. So again, we go back to transportation and we really have to just value where we're spending our money. And I would elect not to spend the money on transportation and put the money elsewhere, such as in uh, the classroom, for example. And I think that's when we started setting goals is this plan has to be cost neutral. 
uh, going into that or result in a savings so that we can return money into the classroom. We spend a significant amount of money in transportation every year. So I think that was a, a valid goal. But um, so we run routes, Randy, and we have to have 45 minutes of those t between those tiers. So 45 minutes between each school cell times. And, and I say that, so if you adjust one, it throws everything else off in the system. So we're trying to develop a system that supports all schools, and that's where it's extremely difficult to meet the unique, uh, unique needs of one family or a group of parents, for example. So, um, you know, and every time we run these routes, it's extremely expensive. So if you can't tier with an elementary and a middle, middle school or an elementary and a high school, that's just a, a bus that serves one school and they're going back to the terminal. So we hired two consultants. We had a significant team. We looked at many different bell times. One bell time we looked at was 9.30 to 4.30, for example, at the elementary level. And what we continually heard from our, our leaders, our instructional leaders, was is our younger students do much better in the morning, not later. Right, so what I heard a lot was is 7.45, they're doing well, they're performing at a high level, and by a two o'clock in the afternoon, they're tired. So when we were thinking about that 9.30 to 4.30, that was a completely opposite of what we were trying to achieve. Ultimately, and again, thinking about kids getting home at night, you know, we're talking about, you know, I know there's been a lot of concern about uh, students now not being able to ride their bikes or uh, walk safely to school. You know, Crestview Elementary is one of our highest uh, uh, walk and bike schools in the entire district. And they have a bell time right now of 750. So I think we've, we've got a proven track record uh, that we can do this and do this well. I know in the wintertime months, it's always challenging for families. Uh, walking and biking to school is extremely important to this district. We put a lot of resources, we'll continue to put a lot of resources into that, and we'll figure out a way to support those families. But I will fall back onto Crestview as a model uh, that this can be successful uh, in getting our families to school safely. You know, to piggyback on what both Samara and Rob were saying, it's really making me think of my own personal experience as well, because with my own children, uh, while they were in school, we had a significant change in school start time. And it, it was a transition. I mean, the truth is, you know, any change is a transition. And what we do know is that we currently have schools that start earlier, that start very successfully earlier. We have schools that start later, that start very successfully later. And thinking about moving in either direction, right, to start earlier or to start later represents a transition. And I do remember as a parent that there was a period of time that it, it definitely seemed different. It definitely felt different. And it, it, it took some planning and some getting used to, to how it is we plan breakfast, how it is, you know, what we eat, when we eat, how, you know, how we get ready in the morning. Um, but I also do want to also piggyback on what Samara was saying about the late start, because you're right. There were times that my children took advantage of and really enjoyed the programs that, that occurred at school. There were also times that they, they, they did what you were describing, that that was a little bit of a flex time in the, school, in the, the week to, to make orthodontist appointments or to, to ride their bike to school in a way that um, they might not get to do, or when they were a little bit older to socialize a little bit more with um, students as they walked their bike to school. So once we made it to the other side of that transition, uh, you know, that felt normal in the same way that the previous situation had felt normal. And so your comments were really making me remember and reflect upon my own experience. I think, again, we do want to just recognize that, that you know, in this moment, it is very, you know, very tough to figure these things out and, and, and recognize. I know that we got a number of um, questions about, you know, specific student needs with, uh, you know, on the autism spectrum, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, uh, we've certainly heard, I think, at our board meeting, you know, the idea of, well, you know, could one school, you know, slightly tweak it or whatever. Um, again, our, our hope is to get everybody on a seven hour day and then, you know, working as a system, it does make that tougher, as Rob was saying. So just I, again, I just want to acknowledge that in no way, you know, we want to make sure that we that we're coming with heart. We understand that this is difficult. 
Um, a couple questions, a couple other questions for uh, uh, for Rob in regard, or I guess for the team in regards to just the idea of um, you know late start versus early release and uh, different days. We've gotten a number of questions along that kind of theme. Of, um, some schools, I think Casey Middle School is an example, has traditionally had a, a, a early release uh, versus a, a late start. Um, you know, we got the question from someone in regards to um, why not sev uh, why seven hours? Why not go to eight? You know, if we really need more time or whatever. Um, you know, and I think this is obviously a, a big, big deal uh, for us to get to seven hours. So uh, that might be another whole kind of question. Um, and then I'll just throw one more in there while while we're kind of doing a list out here, which is uh, we did get a question from uh, um, a uh, mom over at Louisville Elementary. Um, she asked, uh, do you think that we'll still have, uh, and this is actually a benefit that she's seen out of COVID, I should say. Um, do you think that we'll still see soft, uh, soft, soft staggered start in August when we come back? Um, it's one of the things that they've really enjoyed because uh, we arrived to school calmly. I love that she says that. Um, that's certainly possible. I know that that's something that I've seen um, at, at some of our schools, even with the late start, um, you know, even with, with the new time change. Um, who, who might be able to kind of address a couple of the things of why we ended up on the day we did? Oh, I should say, you know, some folks also mentioned, you know, to make it easier for, you know, families, could it be Friday afternoon so we can all take off at the end of the week? Um, which I know, uh, talking to some experts on that, it's a pretty tough time to do PD for staff. You know, their their minds might not be in it at that point, uh, as an example. Sorry, I'm going on. I want to get to the people who actually know things. So uh, who might want to chime in there? Well, I'll, I'll just say um, our colleague, Kent, uh, who's the principal at Superior Elementary, is the person that brought forward that soft start idea. And it is fantastic. Fantastic. The idea came up so that you're not having a little bottleneck of kids during the pandemic, which is what we were doing before, but it is fantastic. So um, I don't know if that would be like a, a district wide decision or if that's, you know, to be down the road, but I'll just speak from experience. It has been a, and I'll talking to colleagues, a really positive experience. Um, and kids come in calm and kids, you know, come in and at our school, they grab breakfast at other schools. It might be a little bit differently, but um, I agree with that mom from Louisville Elementary. And I, I, trying to do PD with teachers on a Friday afternoon would be really, it would just be really challenging. I think um, PD with teachers in, in the morning will be significantly more effective. And if we're asking our community to give us an hour a week, they want it to work and they want it to be effective. And so I would just say that that would, um, Probably, I think it's a good day and time. It's not Monday morning. It's not Friday afternoon. So that's my two cents. Um, was there, I guess one last question to Rob or Robin, uh, just in regards to, was there a lot of conversation in regards to time and placement? Uh, I can imagine that that might've been something that, that was discussed and, and negotiated upon and thought about. Oh, yes. Um, thank you for asking that because it really was very intentional. We had a lot, right, Rob, a lot of conversation around being as thoughtful as possible and intentional as possible about where we place that. Um, and when we think about professional learning and aligning it with uh, staff meetings, school staff meetings, most of which take place after school on Thursday afternoons, and placing that learning at, at specific places throughout the week so that everything that teachers and leaders do build upon each other. And so Samara gave the perfect rationale as to why, you know, Wednesday mornings and morning in general is, is um, prime for teacher learning. But then also it gives the opportunity to then, when you have your, your nuts and bolts staff meeting and talk about the actual planning and implementation of that learning that's taken place on Wednesday morning, it gives you that opportunity on Thursday afternoon to really build on that. And then most, if not every uh, elementary school does a, a community communication of some type, whether that's a Friday afternoon folders or a few of them do it on Monday, but almost everybody does it Friday. Um, or a community email. Um, and then what it does is it allows schools to then deliver uh, timely information to families based on what has gone on during the week and any new information 
information they would need, any additional information that would go to parents about changes in practice or updates on professional learning or updates on the implementation of the strategic plan as we move forward. You know, our strategic plan, all together for all students, really is just comprised of all the factors that are current best practice so that every student in our system has the opportunity to achieve the long-term outcomes that we have outlined. And so it's not just about that professional learning time in isolation, it's about how all the components of both teacher learning and student learning all fit together into the most efficient and efficacious package for both learning and implementation of that learning for students. I appreciate you bringing up the strategic plan because that is such an important part. We, we really are just beginning to, to get traction on it and we want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, I'll just mention one little side note, which is, you know, along those lines, I thought it was interesting, you know, when we went to the new uh, plan for the reintroduction, uh, we talked a lot about the holidays and that was one of the questions that came up with the idea. Of, we have so many holidays, you know, do you duplicate that timing so that when it falls on a holiday, you're, you know, for parents, it's not a huge change there or whatever. All right, let me one more question then. Oh, sorry. Something to that though, Randy, because as we move forward in the academic calendars, what we have done is there, there are a few, we don't have that many in this district, but there are a few uh, professional development days throughout the school year, right? And when um, we were initially talking about this over the course of the past few weeks or months, we said, you know, we really need to do our best because we had parents represented on that committee to look at the academic calendar to align them. So that if Wednesday is our different day, if you will, then um, that different day is also the same day for um, professional development days, that, those handful of days when there is no student contact at all. So that uh, when those occur, parents only have to think about one different day and not professional development on Monday and late start on Wednesday, but really making an effort to, to um, minimize that that decision making or those changes for parents and families. I've got one more question on PD and then I want to warn Renee that she's on deck because we definitely want to get to the child care stuff. Um, that's, you know, when it comes to the Wednesdays specifically, that's been a big question. So uh, in regards to, I think that uh, what you're talking about is so important because I think some parents may really ask that question of, you already have, you know, you take uh, this many Mondays or, you know, I know we've got a Friday coming up like uh, in alignment with uh, President's Day and it's a PD day. Um, you know, parents do recognize, you know, there's a good, good amount of those days that are out there. But again, we felt that this was very important to get structurally um, in alignment so that staff on a weekly basis have this connection. So that goes to the question that I got from, uh, it's actually a teacher over at Fairview, uh, Thomas, I'm going to totally mess up the name of Oviet, um, who asked, you know, what do we expect, in general, what, you know, what are we looking uh, at those, uh, how are those going to be comprised? Uh, they said, are you expecting those Wednesday mornings to be district led? professional development, he adds it as a teacher, you know, that uh, what they've really seen benefit out of is the uh, is the um, in uh, building collaboration and planning. What do, what do you expect that that will look like? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And my very best answer is stay tuned. Uh, because <laughs> We are currently working on developing the guidance and parameters around that because uh, in some ways, an hour sounds like a lot of time. And in reality, an hour is not a lot of time. And so we've got to be able to maximize that because as I was saying at the beginning, and I really can't emphasize this enough, that our teachers are skilled, talented, dedicated professionals. And if we want to support them in not only maintaining their knowledge and skill expertise, we have to uh, help them understand what it means in terms of practices and new ever-changing knowledge in topics like i was saying before what are these foundational components of of the strategic plan but also what is the newest information on neuroscience and um development cognitive and physical development of of children of all ages in our system uh that's a lot of information and we in this community value our teachers knowing and understanding that. And so we have, to, we have to provide that time for them. And so we are being very thoughtful and very intentional as we, as we work toward 
defining very specifically what that time is for. And um, and he's absolutely right. There, the value of teacher collaboration, because it's not just the learning that they receive, but the way teachers make sense of that information through their conversation, through their collaboration, and through thinking about it within the context of what they teach. Because they need to think about these practices and these learnings uh, within the realm of if I am a high school social studies teacher, if I am an elementary art teacher, if I am a middle level math teacher, what does this mean for me in terms of delivering the very best instruction for students that are in my classroom in front of me every day? And so with that in mind, uh, that's what we're currently talking about and um, discussing. So I guess like I say all of that to say, yep, stay tuned, we're working on it. But that's really the thought process that, that we're going through as we start to develop that. And, and I do want to mention that so often we are taking little blips of, of the questions or uh, merging multiple themes from different people. And so, um, you know, for instance, for Thomas, I just want you to know that we will be making sure that the, uh, the additional uh, feedback that you have in regards to PD will, will get to the right people. So I don't want you to think otherwise. Um, uh, Renee, I told you you're coming up next and I am coming to you because so, so many of the questions that we've gotten have been in, in regards to parents worrying, okay, I do have to get to work. Um, I, I'm going to be scheduled on that time, in which I normally uh, drop them off. Um, I know that you guys are committed to, to finding ways to support those students. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, definitely. So we are already working on a variety of options for families. Um, a variety of different programs. So first we'll talk about SAC. So SAC will be in all elementary and K-8 schools and traditional after school program next year. So that won't go away. Um, we're, our plan is not to raise prices. So what you see online is likely what you're going to have for next year. So that's a, a thing for families to look at to go to our child care website. Um, the other thing is that we've looked at the schools that are either not get, having their times adjusted or are the K-8s. And so we're committed to providing Monday through Friday childcare in the morning at all the K-8s, which we already do. Um, and then at the BCSIS High Peaks campus, Foothill, Flatirons, and Ned. I think that's all of them, right? Um, so we're committed to pro providing a Monday through Friday morning option for those schools, and that includes that late start Wednesday. Then uh, we're also looking at SAC at a variety of schools. Um, and, and this is the part where I'm really trying to work with principals and with families. So I really value folks' feedback. If you have feedback, please reach out to me. Please reach out to your principal and your principal will reach out to me. I've been having conversations with principals and definitely I want the parents of the schools that are having a large uh, change in their start time. Your principals have reached out to me. So, so they are taking and moving your feedback forward. And I want folks to know that. Um, so at those schools for the Wednesday late start, um, it, there's some really exciting options. I think we have a real opportunity here and I want folks to understand that. Um, there is SAC and there is childcare. That will certainly be an option. But we have right. lifelong learning too in community schools. And we have already had 50 of our community partners reach out to us and express interest in providing low cost options on Wednesdays, right? So th that opens the door to all kinds of enrichment opportunities for kids and their families. The other thing, I had a conversation with the principal this morning, um, and the other thing that we started to brainstorm about right. is, well, we have some of our support staff, like paraprofessionals, who aren't scheduled to work until 9.30, 10 o'clock. Could they, <laughs> Um, through lifelong learning so that the principal doesn't have to manage it, the school doesn't have to manage it. Could they create a proposal, you know, with us to provide enrichment opportunities at the school in the morning? That might be a homework club. That might be um, a, a dance program. I don't know, any, whatever, you know, out there and creative in the community. And um, we also talked about looking at that classroom monitor um, and, and thinking about what has worked with the classroom monitor already in just these short two weeks. And thinking about there could be parents in the community who might want to have that opportunity to teach through lifelong learning uh, a course for kids. 
And so we're trying to find some low cost options. We will always have scholarships. Childcare will always have CCAP. Uh, preschool childcare will have CCAP and CPP. Uh, we have an internal scholarship program. Lifelong learning will have a scholarship program. So I, I think there's a real opportunity to partner with our families, with our, our support staff and our community here. I just need to so write me. I, <laughs> like that so much, but write me. <laughs> you get that kind of invite. She she wants she wants the <laughs> contact there. She wants to get get moving on this. Um, one of the questions that I have seen uh, quite a bit on too is the idea of BBSD teachers. Uh, I, obviously, we we're we're thinking about the fact that they've got to get to work as well. I mean, Renee, is there any additional thought to that that I should share uh, in regards to those programs that might be there? Uh, I mean, you know, again, if we know the need, so we if if we have five kids it, that are signed up and parents really need childcare, we can run a childcare program in the mornings, right? So we've even talked about, I just had a meeting with our childcare programs manager and we talked about, well, could we do childcare 6.30 in the morning with like to start from 6.30 to 7.45 or 6.30 to 8.45 on those late start Wednesdays, would that help? Um, I don't know. So I really do need that feedback from folks. And if it helps and we're able to do it and there's interest, Let's do it. Awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, oh, a couple of quick questions. Um, I, I, uh, specials, um, you know, they wanted to know how, how this schedule will impact specials. Uh, uh, will specials classes uh, be moved to the afternoon since uh, they're, they're just wondering about the impact and whether or not there might be some movement there? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So I just got an email from. Um, one of our direct wonderful people that is organizing that and and trying to figure that out so she's asking schools that already have um a late start what specials look like and that kind of thing so um the way we've handled it is that well i won't even go into that but somebody's working on it we don't know yet stay tuned like robin said <laughs> Um, we, we got in the time and place. Uh, we're working out some of the details around, like with Renee, making sure that there's care and all that kind of stuff. We, we will be there. We will make sure it's good. Um, one of the other questions that came up, and of course, this is the time and place. If it would have been any other time, uh, there, you know, this, uh, um, this uncertainty wouldn't be there. But of course, we're, we're in the middle of COVID. I'm going to direct this one to Rob. So the, the idea is uh, right now we have reintroduction, which has Mondays off. You've got now this uh, schedule that would take Wednesdays as being a late start. Um, our, you know, again, our hope and dream is that we get back to normal for next fall. Um, we obviously are, have contingency if that's not the case. What would you want people to know? Um, and then, you know, I will say the other thing that I've heard, you know, uh, again, synthesizing a lot of different voices here, but uh, the idea that we've had, we've we've done a lot right now. We've 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 been paying the dues, you know. I think a lot of people would say. Why now, uh, you know, with COVID going on, are, you, are we trying to do this now? Um, those well, are the questions. Uh, Randy, I, I first want to say, when you say why now, I, I think back to, we've been talking about this for a long time, and why hasn't it happened before now, right? And I think that's looking back is, this is what is best for students. And, and, I, and we can all talk about when the right time is, et cetera. Our kids need more instructional minutes. There is no doubt about it. So why not now, I would ask, is we're coming out of the middle of the pandemic, our kids back in our buildings. Every person in this district wants our kids back in our buildings. We are all hopeful that our kids are back in our buildings five days a week in August, right? We gotta see how this pandemic plays out. We would love to communicate that to all our families, but there is a lot of unknowns right now. There's new variants, et cetera. We're, we're still trying to work through that. We don't have enough vaccine, et cetera. So, I would just go back and say, why not now, Randy? And I know this is a challenge and a lot of unknowns, et cetera, uh, but we've been talking about this a lot for a long time. This is the right thing to do. Our kids need the time. We need to make sure that we're providing social emotional learning. I would just ask parents, why not now? And I know that there's a lot of reasons, but there's a lot of unique circumstances out there. But I would say I always go back to what is best for students, and this is what is best for students. And, and I would say that um, at least to my knowledge, one school that has done the, win the Wednesday late start um, suspended it during what we would consider a crisis time, which is, you know, with the reintroduction plan in place. So um, I, don't, I, I don't think there would be any plans to double dip at that point either, because uh, they would have their planning on Monday at that point. Having, 
nobody is doing late start this year. That was a district wide decision. Okay, very good. I appreciate oh, that. Miss it. <laughs> <laughs> I will say we're at six o'clock, so we're technically at the time that we were going to wrap up. But I always want to try to give uh, folks a chance. If we didn't, you know, if we didn't get a chance to address something that, you know, you've been getting a lot of questions on or that is on your heart that you want to say, and I'm going to go and start with Rob Price. Randy, one, thanks for giving us this time, and, and I appreciate everybody reaching out. I want to talk a little bit about, and Randy, maybe you can help me with this, where is the best place to provide feedback? Um, as Renee has talked about, as you've heard Robin and Samara talk, that's what we're looking for. We don't have this plan fully developed, and some of that is because we need feedback. So, Randy, can you hit on that, or Susan, uh, the engagement tool that we're using? Oh, like talk about it, but it's what we were mentioning earlier. Let's talk, right? That's correct. Um, it really is helpful to get all of the information in one place because then we can share that with the team and make sure that we um, have shared out to everyone who needs to know the inputs that we're getting. And the um, links for that were uh, included in the letter that went out from Dr. Anderson yesterday. Um, on the homepage of uh, bbsc.org, there are, are also there's at least one link from there. I think there might be two prompts to get there. Um, and also the um, URL for it is just letstalk.bbsc.org. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's an opportunity there to ask questions or you can simply provide comments through that and to take a survey. And um, a lot of the questions in the survey do relate to some of the um, options that Renee was describing earlier. So completing the survey is uh, helpful to us. And I will just mention one of the things that we ran into before uh, when we were trying to uh, utilize this with the beginning of school. Uh, was that we were having folks, um, you know, leave comments on Facebook and in 12 different places. And so our staff had gotten a little bit overrun with trying to do that. So one of the things that we are going to try to do is really direct folks to this engagement platform where once you sign up for, you, regist you register, you're able to actually uh, sign up for updates in regards to the issue. And so we're hoping to really uh, do more with this tool moving forward. Um, okay, so uh, anything else that uh, feel people feel strongly that they want to bring up real quick here? It looks like everybody's looking like they're okay. Uh, so I just wanna uh, thank everyone on the panel for joining us today. I wanna thank you for your time and for your questions. This has been uh, a, a wonderful hour to be able to talk about you know, the, the concerns and the, and the thoughts that people have on this topic. Uh, we understand that it's uh, not easy to have change, but uh, we appreciate the partnership that we have with you to try to get to the right solution. And we hope that you have a great day. Thank you for joining us.